got a card for um, Bill Wallace's family, and his gravesite is tomorrow in North Carolina. We got a card for Miss Beverly. Card for Miss Bessie May. Now, who heard from? I heard Charlie and Ann. They tested positive. Did Miss Bessie May test positive? Miss Evelyn? Miss Evelyn? Who else? How did Charlie and Ann test positive? Miss Bessie made this. I guess the matriarch is tougher than the family. No, that ain't true, is it? The Donna gets everything. Well, I'm sorry that Ryan didn't make it, but um, we're going to have to do the best we can. Ryan had a migraine. He said today, and uh, something else about some shot he couldn't get. I don't know what that was about, but anyhow, he obviously is not here. I started to put on a dress shirt since I was going to be up here, and then I thought, really? Boy, y'all come in just in time. I done finished talking about y'all. <laughs> and I listened to Ann play it Sunday, and I enjoyed it. And she don't even remember playing it. But we're going to try to sing it. It's two verses. You can remain seated. It's a wonderful worship chorus. Let's sing it. I love you, Lord, and I live my voice. together. Lord, we do thank you. You are a wonderful God, and we are most blessed. And we thank you for how you've even brought us through these last few days since we were last here. We pray, Lord, that we have been good Christian people in these last few days, that we have represented you well. We know that we fail you, Lord, and we thank you for forgiveness of sin. 
We look forward to spending a bit of time worshiping you tonight. We pray that in some way that you would speak to us and guide us. Pray that you'll bless Ryan uh, and uh, help him with his need tonight. We just pray that uh, what we do here uh, will be pleasing to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, we welcome you and... Uh, Good to see you. Hope you're having a good week. Good to be together tonight. Um, I have no idea what the announcements are other than, well, if you need to know anything, check with Melba. Melba's going to call the entire church and tell them that I'm here Sunday. Warn them. But um, Ryan, I think, I hope he'll get over this problem he has. He, I don't know when he's supposed to go. Remember, when's he supposed to leave for Honduras? Friday. Huh? He might miss his plane. Well, sometime between now and Sunday, I assume he's leaving. So it's going to be us Sunday. It's going to be us next Wednesday night. Y'all going to be glad to see Ryan sometime in the next month. But um, for those of you who knew that I was going to be here and you still came, I appreciate it. We will um, do the Lord's Supper Sunday morning. As I found out, Sunday. <laughs> so we'll be doing the Lord's Supper Sunday. What else? Something was coming. Uh, next, is it next? When's the men's supper? 18th. Oh, okay. Well, that's way out there. I don't know why we announced it. Huh? Next Tuesday. Me and Kenneth, we sit right across from each other at breakfast. We can't hear what each other's saying. We don't. We can't carry on the conversation. Okay, next Tuesday. Tomorrow's to Pancake Day. Any other announcements? If there is, feel free to make it. Seems like Ryan made a lot of announcements Sunday, didn't he? Oh, well. Okay. We'll study the Lord's words for a few minutes and then we'll have a prayer time. Uh, two passages of Scripture. You got to put on your um, thinking cap a little bit tonight. Kind of stay with me. And if you're wondering, this is what I was going to do Sunday night. So I'm going to do it tonight. So I don't know what I'm going to do Sunday night. What I was going to do Sunday morning, I'm not going to do it because I'm going to do the Lord's Supper. So I had a real good sermon for Sunday morning. Y'all going to miss that. Yep, but we're going to do the Lord's Supper. Yes, but I'm not going to preach what I was going to preach. 
we're going to talk about the Lord's Supper. I, um, I have trouble with churches that just kind of tack the Lord's Supper on the end of the service uh, and do other things before that. It, and I, that's what I'll talk about Sunday morning. It's meant to mean more than that. And, uh, so we we'll look forward to focusing on the Lord's Supper. See if I'd have preached that other sermon. Y'all may have been weeping and wailing and falling apart, and you'd have missed the Lord's Supper. So, and my wife just said, "Go on." Okay. Romans. Not all people who say they are saved are saved. I think maybe you kind of figured that out. So that's kind of what we're talking about for just a moment tonight. Romans 3, verse 23, Paul wrote, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. God presented him as a propitiation through faith in his blood to demonstrate his righteousness because in his restraint God passed over the sins previously committed. God presented him to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so that he would be righteous and declare righteous the one who has faith in Jesus. Where then is boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By one of works? No, on the contrary, by a law of faith. For we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Or is God for Jews only? Is he not also for Gentiles? Yes, for Gentiles too. Since there is one God, who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Do we then cancel the law through faith? Absolutely not. On the contrary, we uphold the law. And then uh, a more familiar passage on faith, maybe, uh, in Hebrews, in the 11th chapter, first verse says, now faith is the reality of what is hoped for, the proof of what is not seen. And verse 6 reads, now without faith it is impossible to please God, for the one who draws near to him must believe that he exists and rewards those who seek him. Now, suppose you had a teenager. I know that's a scary thought for all of us here. A teenager. Let's say on his um, 16th birthday, he just acquired his driver's license. Let's say you would fill up the family car with gas give him some money to put in his pocket and your permission to let him go anywhere he wanted to go. Tell him to come home whenever he felt like it. That would require a little bit of what? Faith. Uh, faith on your part in the judgment of your teenager as well as trust in those other people that are out there driving all over the road. Um, faith, at, based on the scriptures that we have read, and of course we could consider many more scriptures in the same fashion, um, 
faith is at the center of Christianity. At the same time, to define faith is a difficult thing. It's almost, when we try to define faith, it's almost like trying to define um, love. Uh, we we usually find ourselves using um, analogies to try to define it when in some sense we're actually describing it. Um, to, to define love, we say God is love. Um, hand, to give a handful of let's say your life savings, to give your life savings to a stranger walking down the street and ask him to take it to the bank for you. That, that's faith. That's faith. Um, but regardless of how we choose to define faith, to enjoy what the Lord promised us, the abundant life, you have to you have to come to grips with the essence of what that is faith in God what is faith in um, God the Bible says that we the Bible speaks of our being made right by faith we are the Bible word justified we are justified by faith Obviously, you need to understand what faith is uh, because we are justified by faith. If our justification before God hinges on faith, then we need a, a, a proper and adequate understanding of faith. So let's talk about that um, because Again, I fear that many people have a less, less than adequate understanding of what faith is. And the Bible tells us that. Everybody claims it doesn't have it. Um, so let's break this down. In, let's talk about a described belief. Um, try, to, try to hold on to this for a a minute if you can, a described belief. Biblical faith is more than simply being able to describe it. Um, and we're going to say that's where some people are. Um, descriptive faith is what we know to be a fact, but we have not evaluated it to the point that we have made it a part of who we are. You with me? That's, that's described belief. I know it. I, under, I have some idea of it, but not so much that I've made it a part of who I am. Um, consider the issue of... Um, uh, the issue of racism. Um, those who know that God loves everybody and we are called to do likewise. And yet we still have prejudice toward others. You, you're kind of in the place of described belief. You understand it, but it's not there. It's, um, in um, Matthew 22, Matthew 22, verse 37, he said to him, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the greatest commandment and most important command. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Do you understand that? Then why is there prejudice? Why is there prejudice? The two are, are, a, uh, are a 
a contradiction. Um, attitude is a is a disposition toward action that we are to act upon what we truly believe. Uh, you've always heard actions speak louder than words. To be able to describe an event doesn't mean that it's going to be a part of our attitude just because you can describe it doesn't mean it's going to be a part of of who you are or result in us result in you acting upon it. You have an idea about it, but you don't apply it. It's not a part of your life or a part of your uh, living. That most people, uh, well, let's go back to the, to the same example. It'd be hard to find anybody would argue with the fact that it's wrong as a Christian to have prejudice. And yet probably more than not have prejudice. Where's the faith in that? It's a, it's what, what, what we're talking about is a described belief. I can describe it, but I don't apply it. Um, then, then, so you have that described belief. Then there's a, a what we would we could call a desired belief. This is a level of faith where the person actually seeks out the object of faith to learn about it and to consider it as an influence on their uh, on their life. That's where I think a lot of people are. They, 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 they. As far as Christianity is concerned, they, they are looking into it. They find it kind of favorable sounding to them. But, uh, uh, but they're in that place where they're simply considering it. pastor went in a hospital room where the husband was uh, husband was in the hospital not doing well at all it, things looked pretty grim and the lady said pastor I want you to pray for his healing right now let's put hands on him and I want you to pray for his healing and so the pastor did when he started to leave, she said, I'm, I'm going to go out and told her husband, I'm going to go outside just a minute and speak to the pastor. I'll be back. Walked outside in the hall with him and said, I want you to do his funeral. <laughs> you see, somebody kind of missed the point there, didn't they? Where's the faith? Where's the faith? Um, uh, it, it's like... Um, it's like reading Facebook nowadays. I mean, we the Bible tells us you know people by their fruit. And my goodness, I never saw so many Christian people in my life reading Facebook. Everybody's praising the Lord. People that, to my knowledge, I don't know when they've been in church. What? Well, Where's the, where's the faith uh, in, in some of these testimonies? It, one thing you have is you're, you're destroying the witness because there are so many more people, a lot more people reading Facebook than they are coming to church to learn for themselves. They're getting their understanding of Christianity off of Facebook. That's sad. That's sad. Because, because 
one day this this person, whoever they are, they're on there drinking in some bar somewhere. The next day they're praising the Lord about something. Or, I, I hope you'll pray for me. And the um, people, people on there saying, yeah, I'm going to pray for you and praise the Lord and whatever. And these people don't, don't know church, don't intend to know church, don't plan on being a part of what God's doing. It's a, it's a sad kind of faith, which is, um, which is really hurting, hurting the church and the witness of the church. This is kind of this desired belief. That's that's like that's people. That's like a individual that um, attends Sunday school. They get involved in the discussions. They, they seem to be trying to learn what they can, but their life proves they are not assimilating what they're learning into any, fast, any kind of commitment. Any kind of commitment. Um, if, if, you, if you confront the person, that person prefers to live by what the Bible teaches, that person probably considers himself above those of lower moral standards. But where's the fruit? Where's the fruit? He may even condemn other people who do not live up to what he thinks is the right way to live. But he still is unable to commit himself to anything other than a preference of life. This is, again, where our witness is really taking a beating by that so-called professing Christian. People who express a strong, a strong opinion on the value of prayer, but that person obviously is not living in any other way in the will of God. that person would wax strong on the, on the value of God's word, defend the Bible, but all he gets from the Bible is what he gets in Sunday school or Sunday morning church. That's it. In fact, he would gladly defend his church in the kingdom of God. But truth be known, he gives very little to his church. He won't commit himself to any kind of service that conflicts with what he's about. Day in and day out. You cannot serve God if it fits your schedule. We are not about our schedule. We are about God's schedule. That's why we are here. It's very easy to give credence to, to things which we prefer but are unwilling to live. We prefer this but our lives doesn't show that. That's, that's desired belief. And then finally, there's performed belief. Justification. We are being made right with God. Okay? 
don't have to use the big word justification. Let's say being made right with God. It That can be accomplished in one way. We can't change it. We can't rewrite the standard. We can't make it any different than what it is. There's only one way to achieve justification, and that is by commitment. That's it. It it can't come by our ability to describe it. It can't come simply by our desire to have it. We have to live it. Just because you can describe heaven, it won't get you there. Just because you desire heaven, it won't get you there. There's a lot of people, I'm afraid, need to hear that. Just because you desire it, just because you say you think it's a good thing, doesn't mean it's going to happen. There are several ingredients in a commitment level of faith. And again, in simple terms, and that's the only place I am, we're talking about a personal relationship. There are, there are several ingredients involved in this level of commitment, not described, um, not desired, but performed belief. Several ingredients. One is search the scriptures. Search the scriptures. There, how many people are they calling themselves Christians that are not searching the scriptures? Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. It's difficult to commit ourselves to something of which we cannot speak. You can't, how do you commit yourself to something you know very little about? And yet, So many people who call themselves Christians, they're not searching the scriptures. Um, They're not reading the Bible, looking for God to speak to them on 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 a daily basis. We have to search the scriptures. And, and again, I don't want to be too general. You have to search the scriptures. I have to search the scriptures. If I'm going to have the relationship that I am supposed to have with God, I have to search the scriptures. It's his word. It's, it's how he talks. We have to be people of his word. We have to give God a chance. Well, so often we don't. You know, in uh, in in Luke, when uh, Peter was called to be a disciple, um, he repented after he saw what Jesus did for his fishing business. Jesus told him to go fish again. Peter said, yeah, no need for us to go. I, I'm a professional fisherman. I done been and I didn't catch no fish. Jesus said, try it again. He did. And and that that brought about repentance. We, uh, there's so much that God could be doing in your life, my life, if we give ourselves to him, give him that opportunity. Uh, you can't disregard his word. 
ignore him and expect him to do something in our life. God can bless us even before we make total commitment to him. That's, we obviously prove that, don't we? Because we all feel like we fall short. So we have to give God an opportunity or a chance. And we, we have to choose a direction. Jesus indicated that you cannot, uh, you cannot logically carry out a commitment to more than one thing. So many people are saying, I'm committed to God by profession. I'm committed to God. And yet, the proof is they're committed to something else other than God. They're trying to live a double life. You can't do that. You know that scripture. No man can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one, love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You can't, uh, you can't divide your loyalties. Um, that God doesn't accept that. And he should because he gave his son to you. We're not talking about does he deserve your loyalty. That's been answered. That's obvious. Um, but we have to choose which direction you're going. That's about the best advice you can give a lot of people today that call themselves Christians. Listen, the one thing you need to do is decide which way you're going. Are you going to follow God or not? Because it's one one or the other. And then what you come to understand in that level of commitment, then you apply that to your to your daily living. Apply those beliefs to your daily living. Paul said, I have been I have been crucified with Christ. Um and and I no longer live. Christ lives in me. That's um, that's almost like being born again, isn't it? I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The effect of our choice that we choose to go in this direction, the effect of that choice makes a profound difference uh, every day of our lives. It's not a Sunday morning thing. It's a, it's an everyday thing, with, um, with, with God. Um, that's that's a performed belief, not a described belief, not a desired belief. Um, you have to. You have to know where you fall in these in these categories. Do you really think that God's grace through his son is so cheap that simply knowing the facts is enough? Or that simply wanting to do better is enough? That that's what that's the answer you get from a lot of people. I'm gonna try to do better. Boy. That's somebody that doesn't have a clue what Jesus Christ has done. Um, to simply say, I'm going to do better. Long ago in a faraway land, the servants of a mighty king gathered beneath a huge shade tree that sheltered the king's courtyard. The servants met to discuss the many wonderful qualities of their king. The 
king was a respected soul. He had always shown kindness to his servants. He loved people. Year after year, the servants enjoyed the blessings of their king. They were proud to be seen with him, and life was good. The servants shared many compliments about their leader. One servant remarked, It's so nice to enjoy knowing our king. He has given me so much. I believe I will now spend life sitting under this lovely shade tree and enjoying the many riches that have come my way. Another servant then responded, I'm glad I was able to come today. I too am thankful for the way our king has ruled. But life is so busy with so many responsibilities. I'm just happy that I'm able to give those moments to the king. Now I must be going. There's so many things I have to do. A third servant remarked, I wish I could serve the king in a more faithful way. After all, he certainly is worthy of my devotion. But I am so afraid I might do my job wrong. He can find a better worker than me. After all, we don't want to do the king's business wrong, do we? Finally, Another servant decided it was time to speak. He had been quietly observing the conversation going on around him. As this servant spoke, a tone of fatigue was evident. The servant was weary from much toil in and around the courtyard. His hands were dirty. He had been on his knees in the king's fields, planting seeds, hoping for a harvest that would bring glory to the king. This he did because of his love for the king. This he did because this was the king's request for his servant. As the servant spoke, he spoke not his own words, but the words of the king. And why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not what I say? Biblical faith obviously different than what many people understand as faith. Yet it is the only faith that is acceptable to the king. Biblical faith is the only kind of faith that will enable you to overcome the problem that we're facing in this world. Described faith, desired faith, it's not going to take you through what we're facing and what we have been facing. Biblical faith is the only kind of faith that will promise power to the individual. Biblical faith is the only kind of faith that will bring progress in the church. Biblical faith is the only faith that brings us into an eternal purpose as God's children. Let's pray together. Lord, I pray that we hear something tonight that challenges us to feel confident and firm in our faith. I pray, Lord, that we know that our belief is in you and what we do any day and every day and any moment shows that we're your followers, that we are living for you, that our purpose is to decrease that you might increase. Lord, Help us, each and every one, to truly and genuinely live by faith that you might be pleased with us and that we might be a blessing not only to you but those around us. May it be so in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we'll look toward a, our closing prayer in a time of intercession.
you have the the prayer list. I don't know that it's um, changed any, other than again remind you to remember um, Carolyn and Mike, Ann, uh, Kimberly and Jason, that family um, tomorrow. They travel and. Charlie and Ann tested positive, so we need to remember them. Again, Ryan, not only for his um, migraine problem today, but that he'll travel safely. And, uh, he'll have a good trip. Who else? Mr. Bruce and Miss. Margie, um, Anna, so we need to remember them. Okay. Okay. Anybody had anything good happen or got anything good happen?
following God who's ahead of you. He seems a lot happier working, doesn't he? Than at home with you. I'm sure God had a purpose for him being at home. If you follow him, he has a purpose in everything. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Anybody else? Thank you, Mary. All right. Um, Richard, you want to give our prayer?